that, as I said, we are exploring options to make sure that those taxes are paid to continue uh, or to make sure that that's a condition of license transfer. That is, in fact, a request of the RMA, and we're working on that. Welcome to a special edition of the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Now, today we have gathered a panel of guests to discuss the most recent announcement from the rural municipalities of Alberta. On March 7th, RMA announced that rural municipalities within Alberta are currently dealing with an overall unpaid oil and gas property tax burden of $268.5 million. Now, this is a staggering number, which has increased every year since the organization began collecting the data in 2019. In fact, this represents a 231.5% increase from the RMA's first member survey conducted in February and January of 2019. Now, to break down that number even further, in 2018, the RMA found that $81 million was owed in property taxes from oil and gas companies. In 2019, that number ballooned to $173 million owed, and the next year, 2020, $245 million was owed. Now, over the last two years, that number has also increased. Rural municipalities faced an additional $9 million in unpaid oil and gas property taxes, and in 2022, it increased again by $15 million, totaling $268.5 million in unpaid oil and gas property taxes. Now, according to the most recent RMA member survey, the average rural municipality is facing an average unpaid tax burden of 3.8 million dollars from oil and gas companies. This is a huge burden for small rural municipalities. Staggeringly, seven municipalities have unpaid tax burdens above $10 million from the oil and gas companies. This is an incredible amount of money that these municipalities are owed, and this is causing some significant financial strain. On the other hand, two municipalities have no unpaid tax burden from oil and gas companies, and an additional seven municipalities have an unpaid tax burden below $100,000. This disparity highlights the need for more equitable system. Now, it's worth noting that municipalities have written off $132 million in unpaid taxes since 2015. This means that municipalities consider these taxes uncollectible and will never recover this lost revenue. This is a staggering amount of money that could have been used for essential services and infrastructure projects. Still operating companies are responsible for 41% of these unpaid taxes from the oil and gas industry. This highlights the need for these companies to fulfill their obligation to the companies in which they operate. Now, despite these challenges, RMA members have tax repayment agreements in place with the industry for an additional $45 million in unpaid taxes. This amount is not reflected in the $268.5 million overall unpaid property tax burden. On March 8th, Heather Sweet, an NDP MLA for Edmonton Manning, rose in the Alberta legislature to question the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rebecca Schultz, about the RMA's announcement. Sweet expressed her concern that some communities are forcing to either raise taxes or cut services due to the government's failure to address the issue. She asked the Minister of Municipal Affairs to explain why she has failed to address this growing problem. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The UCP is failing rural Alberta again. Yesterday, we learned from the rural municipalities of Alberta that the amount of unpaid taxes owed to rural municipalities was $253.7 million. This is more than three times as much in the 2019 survey. The failure of the UCP to address this problem is forcing some communities to either raise their taxes from their residents or cut services. Can the Minister of Municipal Affairs explain why she has failed to address this growing issue? 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Now, the non-payment of taxes is absolutely unacceptable and cannot be allowed to continue. We agree with the RMA's assessment that the problem of unpaid oil and gas taxes to rural municipalities is absolutely unacceptable. We're actively looking at options, Madam Speaker, to ensure taxes are paid as a condition of license transfer. We will be in contact directly with delinquent companies, reminding them of their responsibility to pay their taxes. Municipalities also continue to have the option of pursuing unpaid taxes through legal action or the insolvency process. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Given that in this chamber there sits three former municipal affairs ministers who failed to get this done over their term, despite the most recent former minister promising a hammer to address the problem. And given that that same minister admitted a year ago today that his strategy failed and that it was tried, time to try something new. And given that the RMA President Paul McLaughlin has said that he's shocked that we're still having to discuss this issue, yeah. what does the minister say to rural voters who want to know where the money is? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Now, as I mentioned, we are exploring options to make sure that taxes are paid as a condition of license tra transfer. That, in fact, is a request of RMA. We committed to work on that, and we are with the Minister of Energy and the AER. Now, Madam Speaker, we also implemented the special lien during fall 2021, which gives the municipalities priority over other creditors. We also provided RMA with grant funding to provide training and resources to help municipalities use this tool. We worked with the AER strengthen the regulatory framework so that it has the option to consider company records for property taxes and service lease payment. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Given the previous minister said none of the tools that this current minister is using work, and given the rural municipalities are owed over $200 million in unpaid taxes, and given that the RMA President Paul McLaughlin has described this as of rural municipalities being forced to, and I quote, subsidize an industry in a massive boom, period, end quote. But given that the Premier is pushing a massive $20 billion giveaway to pay off companies to clean up messes that are already legally obligated to clean up, is the reason the UCP is refusing to act on unpaid taxes because they're too busy planning to hand out $20 billion to their friends? The I know the member had her questions written in advance, but I'm going to just remind her again that, as I said, we are exploring options to make sure that those taxes are paid to continue uh, or to make sure that that's a condition of license transfer. That is, in fact, a request of the RMA, and we're working on that. More news to come on that soon, Madam Speaker. Now, our recent survey showed that payment plans or agreements with companies have already been put in place for municipalities to recoup $48 million of those unpaid taxes. There is further potential for municipalities to recoup another $28 million from companies that are still in operation. Madam Speaker, we continue to work with RMA on this issue. While Sweet's concerns are valid, there's one significant detail that she conveniently failed to mention. The survey that she's referring to was conducted in early 2019, when her party, the Alberta NDP, was in power. Sweet's question implies that the current government, the UCP, is solely responsible for this issue, but the survey's findings were released during the NDP's tenure. Now, I'm not trying to defend the UCP government or suggest that this issue is not a problem. Still, it's essential to acknowledge the full picture and the historical context surrounding it. This issue is not new and is not unique to this current government. It's crucial for elected officials to be transparent and honest with their constituents, especially when they are questioning the government's actions, or in this case, inactions. While it's easy to criticize the current government for their shortcomings, it's equally important to hold previous governments accountable for their actions. It's time to address the effects this unpaid sum has had on rural municipalities in Alberta. We are joined by rural leaders from across Alberta to discuss how this impacts service levels, communities, and most recently, their budget. We start off this conversation with Reeve John Burroughs, who has been a long-standing advocate for rural municipalities and is the Reeve of Woodlands County Council. In today's discussion, we will explore the impact of unpaid oil and gas property taxes on Woodland County, the challenges faced by these communities, and the solutions that are being implemented to address these issues. 
John, I want to start with the, I think the biggest question that a lot of people is on a lot of people's minds right now. And that is how has Woodlands County been impacted by this most recent announcement by RMA about the $268 million of unpaid oil and gas industry property taxes? How has Woodlands County been impacted? So there's a bit of a history when it comes to Woodlands County, and, and it actually starts back in 2016, 2017 is when we really started to see the rise in the unpaid oil and gas taxes. And then 2018 hit us uh, really hard uh, with nearly four million in unpaid uh, oil and gas taxes. And, and part of that, then in 2019, we got hit with uh, the Trident bankruptcy and uh, municipalities were considered an unsecured lender. So that that all became a, a real issue. Um, and I, that really triggered the whole thing. So as of, as of 2022, we're sitting around a uh, million uncollected or so. So we're still, we're still not uh, quite there, but we're getting better. So I just want to, conf- just want to reiterate this because I just want to make sure I understood. You're saying that currently as of recording this, Woodlands County has an outstanding balance from oil and gas industry property taxes of over 1 million or under 1 million? Just under 1 million. So to be precise, our total tax in arrears right now as of 2022 is 852,655. Okay. That seems like a large number, no matter who you're talking to, whether it be a city or a county. What does that mean at the bottom dollar compared to impact on budget? Because everything comes down to budget, especially since you've just gone through the budget session. This money, what would it have been able to go to in Woodlands County if it was paid properly? Well, you you look at a county like Woodlands and, you know, we're operating on roughly 26 million in collected revenue. So, and, and then I think, that's important to have the conversation around is that collected revenue end of things. Uh, with that, we're looking after a landmass the size of PEI. We have two libraries to look after within our own municipality, four volunteer fire departments that all the equipment that goes with it and almost 900 kilometers of road. Uh, we've got two hamlets with water and sewer in them as well. So there's a fair bit of infrastructure that you're looking after for that, that, uh, that amount of money. And it amounts to the the eight hundred thousand is actually a, a really minimal amount compared to what we were dealing with in 2020, 2019, and twenty eighteen. Uh, in around there, we were six million uncollected in eighteen, four point four million in nineteen, and two point eight five million in twenty twenty. So these were huge, huge impacts to the municipality. So as it as it relates to us right now, um, in 29 let's go with 2018 originally when it kind of really started that was 26.5 percent of our of our overall collected revenue was uncollected uh in 2019 17.7 percent uncollected in 2020 11 percent uncollected uh all the way up to 2022 we're now at three percent 3.2 percent uncollected so the and 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 that's that's really been a, a tough pill for us to swallow. So in in the third quarter of 2019, we we saw that things were going sideways, and we ended up having to introduce a five year economic recovery plan. Um, our reserves had been expended through through these uh, things, and you also wind up in a cash poor situation where, in, in our formula, about one third of what we collect in revenue goes to the province in education tax. So let's say we're out six million dollars one year one third of that uh two million needs to be paid to the province so we didn't collect six we have to pay two we're eight poor uh in in the cash end and it it winds up with a real uh, cash flow crunch so we were lucky we weren't on our debt limit we were able to secure a good operating line of credit and work our way through that but our five-year economic recovery plan basically resulted in a a three percent increase in revenue generation year over year, um, a 15% reduction in overall spending that included uh, capital as well. We were capping capital expenditures at around three million at three million dollars annually and then um, we were 
cutting staff. So we actually ended up cutting eight full-time positions out of the municipality. I'm going to ask the stupid question right now, and I apologize right off the bat. How furious are you right now? Like, that seems like a lot. 26.5% uncollected of your total operating. 17.7, 11, 3.2. Each year you have had to deal and your council has had to deal with these shortfalls. And that means people lose their jobs. Eight people, eight full-time jobs had to be dispersed because of this uh, down this, this unpaid tax. How upset are you? How furious are you at these companies? So, so the, the, the furious part actually comes in later and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that story, but um, and, and I think when we when we talk about the, you know, the furious emotion, I, I think it's it's important that we also recognize that, you know, oil and gas is a huge, um, a huge benefit that we have. Ener Alberta energy is is terrific. It's generally we're some of the most ethic ethically produced oils and energy in uh, in North America. So in the world. And, uh, and, and this, this discussion today is not about Alberta energy. It's about a few bad actors and a few, a few tough times that have uh, befallen the industry. We, there, was, there was a lot of things that came together at, at one time. Um, but the reality is that we're in a different position now than we were before. Revenues are up at most of the oil and gas companies. Uh, natural gas is what, triple tripled in, in value. So, you know, we're not seeing these, these uh, declines in revenue that the companies were originally dealing with. Um, that's, that's the, the, the part that really gets me is that, you know, there is a, a mechanism through the AER to deal with this, but at the moment there, uh, there just doesn't seem to be the will. The, the furious part though comes in around. So when Trident bankrupted, uh, some of their assets were broken up and sold off. When they were sold off, uh, we looked at license transfers and we contacted the AER and actually mentioned to them that, hey, this company that's looking at purchasing this uh, now defunct company's assets uh, out of bankruptcy is has also not paid their taxes. And they said, well, that's not really our problem. So I, I don't know about you, but when I go to license a car or anything along those lines, they have a certain series of tick boxes. And if you haven't caught up on all your all your payments on on you know fines, fees, insurance, registration, all the rest of it, you're not you're not getting your license. So I do not understand the the, the structural issue around the AER. I think it's well within their purview. Uh, they can they can certainly address it through the directives. Now. RMA has called for the AER to make some changes to how oil and gas industry uh, companies who are delinquent in their payments of property taxes to counties like yours to cease operation until they are up and running or till they get back on their feet. Um, are you in favor of this move? And have you heard anything from the provincial government to let you size some sort of relief when it comes to a solution to this issue. And I say issue because it's an ongoing problem for municipalities like yours. Well, and the, the province has tried to address the issue in, in the fact that they've introduced. The are you six, are you happy with how they've been trying to uh, rectify the situation? Well, we've, we've asked for a hammer and they gave us a screwdriver is really what it is. So, <laughs> Um, the, good analogy, uh, man. Well, it's it's not my analogy, but I, I'm I'm borrowing that from someone, so he'll know who he is. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, it there is there is a partial uh, way to address it. The problem with some of these companies is that they're offshore, um, and I the courts are busy enough dealing with some of these things, and and I I don't want to make this a political issue. Uh, this is something that that went on across several different governments. I think this is a structural issue that exists within the AER and, and part of the culture. And that really needs to be addressed. The, the regulator needs to start behaving like a regulator and acting in the best interest of Albertans and Alberta taxpayers. So what would you like to see? What would you like to see as the Reeve of your county? What, what would be the, like, if there was a magic wand, then you could fix one thing today and it would be, what would it be for you around the AER? 
So the, the internal policies, there was conversations around Directive 67 when it was originally coming out and they were redrafting that directive. And to, to kind of background the, the directives, they're, they're basically the policies that, that drive the inner workings of the AER. And I believe that the AER's current mandate actually would easily encompass the uh, just making a checkbox to make sure that municipal taxes have been paid. And I would even go on further in the fact that they have a conversation with the uh, Surface Rights Board and make sure that there are no, no open uh, complaints on the Surface Rights Board, because that's another component that we're seeing of this that I think can easily be addressed through the AER. Uh, there's going to be some data collection that goes along with that. But I mean, every every single municipality has uh, an unpaid oil and gas tax folder sitting on their desk. You want the information; it'll be there within the hour. So, if you include the the surface rights board complaints, the unpaid oil and gas tax, uh, unpaid to the municipalities as part of the process for getting an operating license, I, I think that'd be a huge thing. Uh, that, along with a uh, requirement to do that for transfer, license transfer and uh, continued operation. And, uh, and I, here, here was the frustrating part when the, when the oil and gas company that hadn't paid its taxes. Uh, is it just one asset. for Woodlands County? Is it just one company that's outstanding or is there multiple? Do you know off there's the top of your head? There's a couple. Yeah, there's, so it's not just one bad apple. There's a few bad apples. There, there's a few, but I mean, okay. we've got an awful lot of oil and gas company. And, and keep in mind, the industry is not happy about this either. <laughs> Uh, as, as a general rule, the industry, I think, our, our oil and gas industry and 99% and, and of the players that are in the oil and gas industry are quite proud of what it is they do. And I think they do a good job. Um, there are a few bad actors out there. There's more than one. And, uh, and, and it reflects poorly on the industry and the industry recognizes that. Um, so what I, what I was going to say, though, when that license transfer goes to take place, and you've got, I mean, you've got a, a, an organization that hasn't paid its taxes, then ends up going bankrupt. And, and we saw this. They hadn't paid two years' worth of taxes. Then they ended up bankrupt. When they bankrupted, I think that the, I think that the, total, the total claims against them was somewhere in the $700 million range across the province. And one of those small claimants was an oil and gas service company that's located here in Woodlands County. That particular operator was owed seven or eight hundred thousand dollars by that particular company. So now he has to eat the seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. Now he's he's paid the labor, he's burned the fuel, he's beat up his equipment, he's done the service, he's disposed of the fluids, he's done the job. And he's put the money back into the local economy. Now he's managed to weather that $800,000 loss as a company. And his reward for that is as a municipal politician, I have to raise his taxes. And I hated the, the idea of doing that because the, the best, I think one of the best indicators of whether or not a company is healthy is whether or not they can pay their taxes. If they can't afford to pay their taxes, they probably can't afford to pay their service providers. If they can't afford to pay their service providers and they leave those local companies on the hook, those local companies are the ones who partake in the community. Those are the ones that, that buy the hockey jerseys. They support programs like Community Lunchbox. They're actually involved in the community. When some of the large companies go bankrupt, the community hardly notices it. But some of the smaller service companies that are, that are core to the community, those are, are really important to small communities like ours. So this isn't just a municipal issue then. This is not a municipal issue that counties are just dealing with. The, this is some of the service providers for these oil and gas industries who aren't being paid, like that gentleman that you're talking about. And I can imagine as Reeve, it is a balancing act of trying to find how do we help our county, but also how do we help our residents and the people who have been affected by these oil and gas bad apples who aren't paying their bills? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, we, we've gone round and round on this since, uh, what, 2017, 18 is when it really started to, to heat up. But uh, we've been round and round on this. And, and I, I still think that the, the best option for us is to, uh, 
make it a condition of, of uh, sale and operation and license transfer through the AER. It's just a tick box. It's pretty easy to, to do. And I, and I, again, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a plug, I guess, in for our landowners or speak up for our landowners because you've got, and this, this, this was a surface rights board meeting that I, I went to in Fort Assiniboine and the rooms fairly packed. We had probably 60, 75 landowners sitting in the, in the room. Um, they can't get through to make claims to the surface rights board because the surface rights board is absolutely slammed with complaints. The oil and gas companies are renegotiating leases that, and, and when I say renegotiating, I mean cutting a check for a portion of the amount that they'd agreed to in the, in the previous and then telling the landowner, oh, well, you, you, if you cash that check, then you've agreed to our new offer and that's all you're getting from now on. It, it's very, very frustrating. And then the Surface Rights Board, if there's a complaint, the Surface Rights Board will actually pay uh, from the government of Alberta coffers, the landowner. But that, that trickle down takes years to get to now. Uh, and, and you're seeing, I think last year, they put about 20 million in payments out to surface rights claims. So, which is again, taxpayer money. Uh, so that the, 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 the surface rights is a component of it. It's not as big of a component, but it, it is a component. And I want to make sure it gets included in the conversation because it's really hard as an individual landowner to kind of consolidate those, those communications and get that point across. This is not an easy fix. This is not going to be fixed by the time this airs on Friday. How do you, as the Reeve of your county, move forward with, one, two, three, four, almost five years of companies doing the same thing over and over again. And then the province, the AER, yourself hoping that something's going to be different every year. How do you move forward in a budget cycle that you have to plan for the future, but you don't know how much people are actually going to pay you at the end of the day if they get their bills? Well, and the one, the one part that we did do, and I forgot to mention during our five-year economic recovery plan is if you, if you can believe it, we have a $3 million uncollected tax line in our, in our budget. So we expect to not be able to collect 15, almost 15% of our revenue annually. What? And that, that is, that uh, hold, is hold on, hold on a second. You literally yeah. have budgeted. You have a line item budget in your budget. That says we are not going to collect $3 million. So let's just not even assume people are going to pay this. That's on the doubtful account. You can't spend money you don't have in a budget. So if you if you assume that you're not going to get the three the three million, then you don't end up over at the end. Keep in mind, municipalities cannot run a deficit. So at the end of the year, if we if we end up overspending. Uh, we're either taking out a high, you know, a, a, a loan where we've overspent. We, you can't, you can't spend more money than you take in. Uh, which is understandable. It's just weird that you're like, you're kind of being sincere, but jokingly saying, yeah, it's $3 million here. Like, I'm not trying to be rude here. It's just, it seems such like a big number that as a taxpayer myself, I would be pissed off and I'm not trying to be rude here, but I'd be pissed off that if companies aren't doing this, that $3 million could go to a new road, an upgrade for a service level. Like that's a lot of 15. Man, I can imagine your job's hard during this weird moment we live in right now. Well, yeah, it, it, it's not, it's, it's definitely a, a difficult time to take over, but where we've addressed it, we're, we're getting a good relationship with the, the companies that uh, continue to operate. We're trying to maintain service levels. We have had to cut service levels around some particular things we've, and, and the it's, easiest place to cut it out is on the capital side. So if you use kind of the municipal affairs funding model, we should be spending about uh, $8 million annually on replacement costs on uh, on the capital side so that's repairing roads and and water and sewer and buying new equipment all of that uh, we've limited that down to three million annually for the last five years so we we do have a big repair that we had to take on this year that we're debenturing but uh, for the most part we stayed within that within that uh, amount and, and it's the I know the three million sounds like a lot but uh, it it actually worked well for us in a budgeting 
thing. I, I, I don't know how else to, uh, how else to explain it. You, you just can't count on the money that's not coming. How much have you had to, uh, uh, write off because I can imagine like past because of going back to, I think it was 2018 RMA announced that municipalities like yours, I'm not saying yours exactly, but there has been a lot of write-offs of uncollected property taxes from oil and gas companies and property taxes in general. Has the County of Woodlands County had to write off any previously uncollected taxes that you just say, we know we're never going to get. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the part of the reason why you have to write those off is part of the, uh, the PERP program, the, the provincial yeah. education recovery uh, program. So once those taxes are written off, you can recover back the, uh, the school amount, which as I said, was for our municipality, I use the rough formula of around one third. Um, but we wrote off $12 million. What would you want residents to know of Woodlands County or in Alberta as a whole that we haven't talked about yet? Because I can imagine we have just scratched the surface of this issue, but there's probably a, something that you want people to know about. Well, there's a there's a couple of things, I think, um, you know, one the one thing is that the and, and I know the, the province is worried about some of these things falling into the, the Orphan Well Association and they're they're worried about the, the spillover that occurs from these these types of things. But uh, leading these or, or letting these companies continue to operate, I think, in this environment, uh, I don't think it, it it might sound harsh, but I don't think it benefits anybody to let that horse limp around that long. Because when these companies start to go down, as I said, they act like a gravity well and they start pulling in healthy companies that are local companies into them. And and I, I really don't want to see that. And it's hard as a, as a small business operator it's you're spending most of your time trying to figure out how to provide your service to your customers and how to do your accounting and how to, how to continue operating year over year. You're not really paying attention as to the background on the companies that you're dealing with. You're kind of assuming that they're going to pay their bills. So you, uh, you have a difficult time collecting that as a small business operation. Uh, that that's the biggest thing. Uh, oh, and the other thing is that the liability at the moment doesn't follow the the uh, the asset. So with the with the decision from the from the courts, um, let's say we let's say we have a piece of property bankrupted in a in a small town, and that building is worth a million dollars, and every year that it sits empty, it it accrues twenty thousand dollars in taxes, and then another twenty thousand in taxes. And then another twenty thousand in taxes, and it sits there empty for three years. Um, that tax bill ends up getting attached by the municipality to the sale price of it, and whoever ends up coming in to buy it buys it at you know the the purchase price might be a million dollars, but they'll say, well, you know, it, it, it's owing one hundred and twenty thousand in taxes. I'm not paying a million for it. I'll I'll reduce that by one hundred and twenty thousand. That's what I'll give you, and the rest of it goes in taxes. That doesn't happen on the on the well site end. So when these when these companies sit dormant, um, we're still running like that. It, it's it's a difficult one because we can't we can't get the uh, we can't get the back taxes collected. So how does the acquisition of new wells relate to municipalities? Because I can imagine. When you're a municipality having an oil and gas company who can't pay their taxes and then is acquiring new assets to then produce more money for their companies by not paying you is probably cringeworthy in some sense to say well, you, you're pro you're willing to not pay your taxes, but you're willing to go buy more land to produce oil and gas. Yeah, and, and as a business model, I mean, the, the reality is you want to buy low and sell high, right? So what what they're doing is you'll you'll get an organization or a company that'll say, well, you know, we're really not making much money off of oil and gas right now. We can't afford to pay our taxes, but hey, there's this well site over here that we'd really like to acquire these series of properties. Um, with allowing the license transfer to happen, what, what the AER is actually doing is they're using the Alberta taxpayer or they're allowing that company to use the Alberta taxpayer as the bank to finance the purchase because they've got, they've got a loan from the municipalities that are not getting paid in tax revenue uh, because there's no mechanism to, to get them to collect. So 
that's a, a, a real problem for uh, for Alberta taxpayers to be on the hook for funding the expansion of oil and gas companies that are that are that want to operate that way. And as I said, it it, it this all boils down to a, a, a way of doing business for a few bad actors. Do you talk to the bad actors? Do you because you talked about how the, they'll go to the province and ask for uh, transfer of licenses and all that. But will the companies come talk to Woodlands County and say, guys, we understand that you we owe you money for property taxes, but we just can't do it this year because our revenue is low. And, you know, we we've had conversations with some companies that come um, and we've like whatever we do for one, we tr we do for all. Uh, so we have had companies that come and, and ask for uh, reductions on this or that. And, and we look at everything as a case by case basis. And we're willing to work with anybody, not just oil and gas companies as municipalities. And I, and I think the, the part of the problem is that people look at a municipality as kind of some evil entity that just does nothing but collect taxes. And, and, you know, we're just rolling around like Scrooge McDuck in a, bed full of cash and that's wait that's wait not, whoa whoa breaking news here john you're not right? what? <laughs> no no not at all what we are if you boil it down to and and what i've tried to do is the, the idea is that we are a service provider we look after roads we look after water we look after sewer we look after uh some forms of recreation we look after agriculture we look after land use we look after all of these things and there's a cost to looking after all of these things we communicate with residents. We try and have conversations with everybody and try and set service levels uh, at an area that they're comfortable with paying for and try and do the most efficient job that we can with the money that we have. That's our job as a municipality. So when you look at, at us as being little more than a service provider and, and then people feel that they don't need to pay, well, you're going to start losing your service. And that's the problem is that we uh, that's the situation that we're in right now. You're, you're a reef. Your council is dealing with this issue. you you as reef is dealing with this issue. RMA is dealing with this issue. Does the average resident in Woodlands County know about this issue? Would you, if I go talk to a hundred people in Woodlands County and say, do you know how much of unpaid property taxes are for oil and gas industry? Would they know, or would they even care? Like, is there communications from the County saying, guys, this is why this is happening. Or is it sort of being not talked about? Well, when, when we ran into the real economic crunch, there were some other factors that went along with it. Um, and, you know, I would liken, because we've even talked about municipal reserves and how much cash should a municipality have in the bank uh, for these types of things. And, you know, uh, personal finance advice, they'll actually tell you, you should have a, basically a year's salary or very least four months salary set aside. So that you can, if something absolutely horrible happens to you, you can float your, your, uh, your family and your expenses and everything along. With municipalities not able to run at a deficit, that means a, a large portion of that should be in reserves. Uh, so we were in a situation where we didn't have uh, completely funded reserves at that point as well. So it, it starts to bleed cash very, very quickly. The, um, that that message kind of got mixed in with some of the unpaid oil and gas. So the, the unpaid oil and gas was, was uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay. There's been a lot of chatter on Twitter and social media over the last few days since this announcement saying that municipalities should just do what they do with property taxes for residential owners put a lien on the property, put a, uh, put a motion or put something on the property. So that way they can take it out from underneath the oil and gas company and then go and sell it themselves through a tax sale. Can municipalities do that? Can municipalities and counties like yours just take a property from an oil and gas company, like a commercial site and sell it through a tax sale? We've had, we've had conversations around seizure. Uh, the, the reality is though around seizure uh, you know, let again, let's take that back to a house. If you're seizing a house, well, you're seizing a house that's got some value to it. But keep in mind these uh, well companies or well site uh, types of, of uh, assets 
have tremendous environmental liability that goes along with them. So you might see something with an environmental liability that's higher than the than the uh, the sale price, and that's bad business. So now you're now you're on the hook for something really uh, re- really disastrous. Uh, th- those are the that's the that's the hard part for us. But you have had that discussion, but it's not something that you're looking at right now. Oh, absolutely. We've had that discussion, but you know, let, let's face it, municipalities, you know, we run water and sewer systems. We, uh, we plow roads. We do that. Uh, we're not, we're not in the oil and gas business. Uh, it's, it's a tricky business and, and it's highly technical. We, we don't, uh, we don't belong there in that space. And again, the environmental cleanup that goes along with some of these, the environmental liabilities that go along with those properties are, are horrendous. So uh, it's it would be very risky business for a municipality to behave that way. Uh, I want to thank you so much, John, for doing this. It's been an honor to chat with you and just uh, dissect your brain a little bit and try to come up with a solution to this. But it does not seem like there's going to be a solution anytime soon, because until the AER gets off their butts and does something, we're going to be stuck in this holding pattern, aren't we? Well, and and that's why we suggest the uh, the AER. And like I said, I'll I'll reiterate it. I don't I don't want to make this a political problem. I don't want to make it a um, a a, um, a knock against oil and gas. Uh, I I think this is a structural issue and a cultural issue within the AER. The AER has got to start behaving like a regulator in the best interests of Albertans and uh, stop being quite so friendly to oil and gas. Now we turn to Reeve Carino Williams, the Reeve of Northern Sunrise County. Reeve Williams is a, an experienced and highly respected leader. Her insight on this topic will be invaluable in helping us understand the challenges facing rural municipalities and the impact unpaid oil and gas property taxes has on rural communities. Karina, can you tell me and tell my listeners and my viewers how the recent announcement from RMA about some bad apples in the oil and gas industry, failure to paying their property taxes, has affected Northern Sunrise County. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to be very clear that we do have a good paying oil and gas here, but we do have a few bad apples and those are the ones that are still operating and still using the roads, the infrastructure, our bridges, and still refusing to pay their taxes. That would be the same as us not paying our mortgage, but still living in the same house. So how has it affected the county's budgeting process? Uh, The RMA has announced that, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm I'm probably getting the number wrong here, but over $200 million over the last few years of unpaid property taxes from oil and gas industry companies in the entire province. Take me into the perspective of Northern Sunrise County. How much is uh, unpaid to Northern Sunrise County for, for these bad apples? So if you look at the overall since this was starting being calculated, which is was in 2018 and a slightly earlier, it's $643,936. As of 22, however, that has reduced to $90,937.43. We are very fortunate that we're not one of the municipalities that has been hitting as hard as our others. However, we still wish to advocate for our other municipalities that these oil and gas industries that are still operating and not paying their taxes need to be respectful that they are still traveling to their workplace on these county roads. What does it mean for the municipality, though? Because I can imagine while it, you are one of the seven municipalities that has under 100000 owing from these companies, it still affects your bottom dollar. It still affects your bottom line when it comes to services. When people don't pay taxes, it affects services. And while you are, and I, I'm not trying to boast you here, but while you are one of the lucky ones that hasn't seen a large uh, unpaid burden you do have still a burden and it does affect your uh, service levels or potentially staffing has it 
impacted that budget service level or staffing or have you been able to weather the storm in some sense? We've been able to weather the storm. However, by doing that, we are dipping into our reserves to weather the storm. Now, as those reserves start getting smaller, that's when the harder questions have to come in of what services are we going to reduce? And that's something we don't want to do for our residents. What's next? What happens now? Because the RMA has put out this press release saying that they want the AER to uh, stop these bad apples from operating until they fulfill their bargain of paying their property taxes until the, until that happens or until the provincial government does make changes. How does counties like yours and others throughout Alberta weather this unprecedented storm? Well, again, as I've said, we're one of the more fortunate ones. However, those ones that are not as fortunate as us, they've got some real difficult decisions to make. And I I really feel for them. The government is not supporting us. They tend to be supporting AER in a way that they're not coming behind us and saying, there is a simple solution here. Don't allow another company to have another license when their taxes are outstanding. It's a simple no-brainer to us. We just don't understand why the government is not picking up that simple method. And this isn't this isn't something that just is unique to this current government. This issue has been going on for some time now from what uh, when I talk to the county, the Reeve of the county of w- Woodlands County, sorry, I always get those two words mixed up. He said that this is not a, a, a unique issue to this time and date. It's just we're starting to see it more prevalent now because of these member surveys that RMA is conducting. Oh, absolutely. And when you look at their, when you look at the fact sheets for these bad apples, Who's getting paid still? The shareholders. Our biggest question is why are the shareholders getting paid when the municipalities are having to reduce their services so that they can keep operational to keep their staff going? This is just wrong. We always think of uh, issues like this as, as a municipal issue, but we have to remember that sometimes these companies do business with companies within your community. They may be working with a small pipe fitter. They may be working with the mom and pa shops in your community. Have you been hearing reports from your local businesses and local community members saying, while you're not getting paid, we're also not getting paid as well. And we need someone to champion this issue because we still have to pay our mortgages. We still have to pay our property taxes and we want to be upstanding members of society. Are you hearing about the ramifications that this has trickled into your community? I've only heard of a very few, to be honest. A few is still, uh, is more than a lot. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. We, we are aware that there are some unpaid tax or unpaid bills out there to, as you had said, the mum and pop, pop shops. I believe um, we are fortunate that we have some bigger oil and gas that we collaborate very well with. We have great partnerships with. However, going back to those bad apples, and I think as Paul likes to call them zombies as well, these are the ones that are, are giving issues mainly to our other municipalities who are our neighbors. And when they're affected, to me, the the region is affected. So it trickles down to everywhere. It's not just, you can no longer look at it as what affects each individual municipality. It's how this is affecting the whole region. For those bad apples that we've talked about, or those quote unquote zombies uh, companies, as Paul has uh, so eloquently termed in the press release, um, Have you or someone at Northern Sunrise County spoken to anyone in these bad Apple companies and say, what's going on here? Why aren't you paying? Or have they ghosted you and not even talking to you about why they're failing to pay their property taxes? Or is that conversation even happening at your level right now? 
with our bad apples, we have reached out to them. We've given them arrangements to pay monthly or um, however would be appropriate for them, maybe every three months or something. We have had a couple that have uptaken on that. And if they've paid on time within the month or within the status that we've given them, which is usually a year, then we will work out on the interest side of that as well to give them, try and give them some help there. So we have had some that have taken up on that and we've been able to resolve that. There's um, some that we've never heard from again because obviously they've closed up and, and left. We are in a uh, an era of unknown. We're going into a provincial election and this issue while it's important in March of 2023, May 2023 might be completely different. How do you see your role as Reeve of Northern Sunrise County making sure, and along with RMA, making sure that this issue isn't forgotten about come election time and you hope to get an answer from all the political parties that are out there? That's where our key application role is. So when we're at RMA, we have the bear pit session we have opportunities to speak to the ministers when they're in the open foyer. Any chance we get, that question keeps continually being asked. Are you Is, satisfied with what, the answers that you've been getting? No. I can honestly answer that very easily, that no. The, the government so far has been letting all municipalities down and not fixing the simple licensing agreement which would be easy to do we're not asking the provincial government to collect taxes for us which is something they tend to want to turn around to municipalities we're not asking that we're asking and the same as paul at rma it's had stated if it shows on the books their taxes are unpaid why are they getting another license to work again now, I, I, I hate to ask the political question because, uh, well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I want to ask it anyway. In the Legislative Assembly, Minister Schultz, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, says the, the, this government's working with municipalities like yours and working with the AER to change the way that this uh, process happens, including uh, adding on uh, the potential issues of failure to pay property taxes, surface rights uh, payments uh, to industries who have failed to pay them. Um, this is a small step, but is this a, is this a step in the right direction? We're hoping it is. We're, we're not understanding why it's taken the government so long to get to this point. This message be, has been going over and over for since I've been elected, and that's since 2017, I've I've heard this in the radar, and the government has almost washed it aside and put it on the responsibility of the AR. The AR then comes back and says it's the responsibility of the provincial government. The provincial government then says it's the responsibility of the municipal government. It's a triangle, and no one is fixing the triangle. Someone needs to come up with a simple process to say, if you have unpaid your taxes, you don't get to operate until that's paid. What would you want the minister or the AER or political parties to know that we haven't talked about yet? Because I can imagine we've just scratched the surface and there's probably that one thing you're like, I need to get this out. What is that one thing that you would love these, uh, the government officials at the provincial level and at the AER to know about what's going on in your communities when it comes to this issue? I would say full transparency and full conversation between the two. We can never get them together at the table. And why is that? All we hear is them bouncing off each other. Not once as the AER and the provincial government sat together in front of any municipality so we can ask the questions. We're always having to feed between the two. And that's the biggest question I have is, why can you not come to the table and give us a straight answer? Have you even been able to speak to someone at the AER about this issue? No, you can reach out to them. Um, we can get our CAO administration to administration to reach out. We have 
asked for a presentation in council. That has never happened. And that's why I'm asking is why is it we can't get AER and government to the table? It, it's surprising to me that in 2023, with all these technologies that we have, with the Zoom that we're conducting this interview over now, you, you're still having issues sitting down with an organization that is so instrumental in this uh, province that it, it is shocking. And I can imagine as the reeve of your county, you hit your head against the wall sometimes when you see that organization doing things that just contradicts how you need to run your community. And that's where, to me, it goes back to, or I can't say, I shouldn't say to me, sorry, our council talks of accountability and transparency. Transparency, there is none. There is none to give a black and white answer. It's always go around the circle, blame this one, blame that one. Who's to blame here? They bounce off each other and nobody fully comes forward to say we've made a mistake. How can we fix it? All these years, municipalities have told AER and the government there's a simple fix to this, but nobody wants to take that big step and put that in black and white. While they haven't put it in black and white, the issue still remains for uh, communities like yours and others throughout uh, Alberta. What has council looked at to try to recover some of these costs internally for yourself? Because while it is important to get the provincial government and the AER to get on your side, you can't always rely on companies like the AER or the provincial government to sit down and have that conversation. So in the meantime, what are you doing? Is it looking at budgets and saying, okay, we have to plan to not collect $80,000 every year from unpaid property taxes because we know no one's going to pay them? Or are there other issues that you're looking at, whether even be putting a lien on these properties so if they sell it, you can collect some money back? What are the options that you have in place right now? Right now, our options legally are very weak, and that's (laughs) our biggest loophole. That is the saddest statement I've ever heard. I apologize, but they are weak and you're being honest about that. And I can, I totally believe you on that statement. Yeah, we, we have nothing that we can chase down, shall we say, to collect these taxes. And that again is down to the provincial government and the AR not putting those, those tools in place for us. We're all Albertans. I can speak confidently for all of us is we're fiscally responsible we're always very careful with our budgets sometimes we may have to transfer from one year to another of a project that we're looking to do maybe we bump it another year to see if that following year our funds change again that we're in a more of a positive state as I've spoken to you before we're one of the fortunate ones However, I, I'm very aware that there are municipalities that are in a crucial crucial state of finances and municipalities cannot run as a deficit, yet an oil company can. And when I think of our residents, the first thing a bank will do is foreclose if they don't pay their, their mortgage. Yet these zombies and... Um, bad apples can continue. And where where is the process in that? Why is it being allowed when you look at their books and their shareholders are still receiving their funding? Reeve Williams, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, I want to end on this question, though, because you, you set up a good point to your last statement there. Do the, does the average person in Northern Sunrise County, and I know you're one of the fortunate communities, do, does does the average resident know what's happening when it comes to these bad apples? Do they care? Because I am not trying to be rude with that statement. I asked uh, John Burroughs this question as well. Would, would the average resident know that there are issues with bad apples in the oil and gas company who aren't paying their property tax, taxes, which then result in issues around budgeting while it may be small for you it's larger for other municipalities yes we have we've been very transparent with our residents in um when this was first 
I want to say it was 2018, we sent out a very strong message that if we were in, in arrears of our major income for our revenue, that the, uh, the increase in taxes would be astronomical to our residents. But at the same token, we also thank our oil and gas that are paying their taxes on time. And that's where I want to make sure that the message isn't always negative. We embrace our great collaborations we have with our other oil and gas companies here that are here. They call Northern Sunrise their home. And we do celebrate them being here. And we appreciate the income that they bring in that allows us to do what we can for the region and our residents. But we have been transparent in letting residents know that if this ever did change, this would be the consequences and they would be quite stringent. Finally, we turn to our last guest, Reeve Larry Clark of the County of Stetler. Reeve Clark will be providing insights into how his community has been coping with this ongoing challenge. Uh, Larry, I want to, I, I guess I should start with the, the million dollar question here. And how has the burden of unpaid property taxes from some bad apples in the oil and gas sector affected your community? Hey, it, it has, has really affected our community because it basically affects our, our base income for the given year that they don't pay. And a lot of these bad actors figure if they get it away, get away with it for one year, they can do it repeat years. Um, that it's a double hit to our taxpayers though, because we have to collect requisitions for the government. One, one of the biggest requisitions on our taxes or anybody's taxes, your taxes in Calgary, I'm sure is the school tax. Uh, we collect school tax or we, we bill for school tax along with taxation to these oil companies, for these bad apples. And then we have to turn around and remit that money to the government, whether we've collected it or not. So then we are taking out of our budget taxpayers, the, the good rate payers, tax pay dollars to, to make those payments. So it, it is it is just, it's disgusting on how they, what they're doing to a community. Uh, also with those requisitions, we've got, you know, your a big part of your tax bill in our county, any house is uh, seniors housing. We all, every, every we, we tax for seniors housing. We put that into that, the senior housing piece uh we tax for policing now and i think probably in the past you probably did articles on on the rural policing uh you know and, and with that with reductions in services from the provincial government and through policing we've an increase in crime we've also had a double whammy where our municipality has picked up uh, we've got four full-time staff in our uh, community police services so so we're paying for that taxes plus we're not collecting this other tax for for policing so it 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 really does hit your communities so do you mind me asking and i'm not sure if you might have this number off the top of your head how much of that 268.5 if i'm not mistaken million dollars that the rma announced on march 7th is the burden that stetler county or the county of stetler is uh dealing with right now um right now uh, yeah well i would say if, if i can use over the last can i use over the last three years go for it go for yeah, it yeah yeah be, be, because uh trident uh resources was one that went down yeah and that had complete you know government blundering with it trident resources had come into our office dealt with us uh was going to come up with a taxation payment plan then we read an announcement that they're buying another company and then shortly after that they go into solvency or bankruptcy so we were out, uh, it was over, it was $4 million for Trident, just as one company. Um, Trident was a, was a big hit, but Trident, there was a lot of side effects to it too. We, um, we were not part of the receivership as a municipality, which we're trying to lobby the government to change. Uh, we also with Trident, uh, we had a gas plant that had been operating in our area, sour gas plant for since 1950s. And it was an Nevis gas plant. Kira was the current operator. There was a lot of the Trident, which was sweet gas going through that plant, about 40% of their volume. They shut the plant in because of that. Then the AER turned around to our good producers and basically was going to hold them to task on flaring. And for because they the sour they could no longer put to that plant. 
they did come to agreements, but we were in great fear that our, that our good producers were going to be shut in also. So then how do you collect taxes from those individuals, you know, when they're not getting paid anything and it's not, it's not to their doing. So we have a plant that was about a half a million dollars a year. We're still taxing because it's not totally removed yet, but uh, not to that full amount. It, it decreases every assessment year, but we, we had that plant that had a lot of jobs to our area that, that those people either would be paying taxes to the town of Stettler, the county of Stettler, or the city of Red Deer or, or county of Red Deer. And then, uh, you know, we, we turn around and th so they're, they're off the books too. So, so it really had a, had a pyramid of, or a, an effect, you know, where, where it just kept going and going. Uh, right cur currently, every time the school tax, the county of Stettler in 2018 or in 2017, uh, lobbied the government strongly on the school tax portion and they came up with what's the you know the short name for it or the acronym is PERC which is provincial education requisition, requisition repayment re repayment credit. credit credit at the end I guess so provincial per education yeah. requisition credit yeah provincial equ uh, education requisition credit and the county of Stetler lobbied all county municipalities of, of have uh benefited from that now because it, it's been brought in this this whole perk thing and you can if you write off the taxes for a company but you're writing everything off you can you can submit and collect on the school tax portion so we did that with with the trident piece we've did it with some other companies um we set up a lot of payment plans with with de deficient companies but that doesn't come that doesn't come without a cost You've got a lot of administration time, a lot of uh, legal fees to set these contracts up. And then a lot of times they're asking you to eliminate penalties, et cetera, as part of that plan. So it just continues. You, so, uh, I just want to jump in here for a second because I want to know, you've just gone through your budget cycle, which I'm assuming the county has started early last year and it's either approved or ha is going to be approved uh, in the coming days. How yeah. has this burden challenge the budget cycle for the county is it harder to budget when you have companies three years ago even not paying four million dollars in property taxes absolutely and and it hit us you know right at about the same time as that other thing called covid uh so so you have a lot of people that weren't you know we were having to pick up our tax rates to people that were sitting at home because their, you know, their jobs were in jeopardy because everything was being shut down because of COVID. So, yes, it, it did affect, really affect our budgets because we tried to get through those years with minimal tax increases. Um, you know, and right now the county of Stetler operates, we, we have 2,700 kilometers of road. One of our biggest expenses, our biggest expense is public works and most municipalities are. And, uh, but, you know, graders, graders are a huge expense to any county. So we've got, we've got graders, uh, we've got about 16 on our fleet <clears throat> and uh, a grader, we bid graders out years ago, I want to say years ago, three to four years ago, and replaced four on our fleet. And uh, the price has come in almost double on those now. We just are putting bids out as we speak. So that shows what's happening to everybody else's budgets too. So, you know, all of a sudden we're, you know, in three to four years, we have our value of a dollar is, is been cut in half. So if you don't have those payments coming in, you assume when you build, when you put your tax notices out that you're getting paid for that. So you plan your year on getting paid for that. I guess we're smart enough to realize the ones that have missed multiple years, you think we may not collect again this year, but we have been pretty successful with our, with our legal on uh, setting up agreements. We talk about the impact that it has on the municipal side, but are you hearing from local businesses, other oil and gas uh, companies, that they're also being impacted by these failure to pay property taxes or even pay their bills? Because while we always want to think about the municipal, we also have to think about the businesses, the mom and pa oil fitter who is operating in your community. Are you hearing stories about unpaid bills to them as well and how it has impacted their uh, services? Well, no, absolutely. Uh, when, when we talk on the business side, a company like Trident, even, even as close to employees as you could get was their contract operators. They basically stiff their contract operators for two months pay. Uh, when, when the, the banks 
basically called the loan. They said to shut all the production in. Luckily, we have locals and some non-local uh, that were contractors that went out there losing money with their pickups and their time again to properly shut stuff in so that our area was protected, you know, uh, safely protected. And uh, the residents nearby were protected because of, of uh, shutting this in. So, yes, it affected them. They didn't get paid. Same thing. There are repairs. So, you know, you missed two months as a business and as a, as a contract operator, and it left a bitter taste in a lot of those people's mouths. Uh, then we, uh, Nick, your screen went black. Okay. Then, then, then it came back. Thank you. Um, then we went, uh, they did have another company come in and uh, who is, is producing the properties, majority of the properties for Trident in our area. A lot of those individuals did go back to work. But yeah, it, it, it affected the pipe fitters, the electricians, the, the contract operators, the the only ones that it disappoints me on that is the way Trident worked out of it. Uh, they they basically got rid of their their all their executives, so they were paid out on their contracts. So at at, at the at the end, they got RMA has called for the AER and the provincial government to do something about this. And one of the things that they're looking for is for the AER not to give licenses to or uh, these bad apples who have failed to pay property taxes, what would you, as the Reeve of your county, want to see addressed, if anything, in the next few months to hopefully rectify some of these uh, burdens that your community and other communities around Alberta are facing? Um, I would, I, I'm in full agreement with RMA. I'm very vocal with RMA for our district, too, on this matter. I guess to, to put a little background on me also, too, is I was a production manager for a major oil company that left the province about seven years ago. And uh, so I didn't know it was an option not to pay your leases or your, your taxation. That, that never, never crossed my mind that that was a way to save money on your, you know, especially on record, record years that they're making right now. So um, another part of it is, is eight yards drop something. And, and forgot about it, I think, because we used to have suspended and abandoned well lists. And as companies, if we didn't maintain those lists, you didn't get your next drilling license. You didn't get your next pipeline license. You didn't get your next plant license or compressor license. So you had to maintain those at a certain level based on your operating wells, or you did not move forward. So I had, I had a full staff that worked on suspended and abandoned wells so that we, that our, our workflow went went uh, as it should, eh? So that's one of the issues right there is that somewhere we had the rules in place. I don't know if it's with downsizing with these with agencies or what's happened, but you know, some somewhere this was lost and it shouldn't have been. Um, as far as as tax collection though, if if you as a resident don't pay your taxes for three years, your property goes up on tax sale. But as an oil company with a leased property, um, we can't take that property from the farmer that they're not paying their lease to and put it for sale. In a lot of cases, if you seize the equipment on the lease, all you're doing is seizing a liability and they'd be clapping for you when you, when you took you know, on that extra liability. So um, what they have to have is they can't sell it or somebody couldn't buy those properties or, or, they, or to that point where you do not move forward, you do not buy another company unless your taxes are paid or your, your, these, these wells are kept in accordance because they're having way too many uh, of the extra costs affecting the production that they make is, is really what happens. To is the issue of orphan wells a big issue in of the county? Um, not, I wouldn't say bigger than any other areas. Okay. Um, but, but yes, it, it is, it is a, a definite issue. And with the orphan, orphan wells, um, you, you see these wells hit the orphan well program and then people come along and cherry pick People that know, so I would say past executives, et cetera, uh, cherry pick the best wells and try to get, you know, a hero cookie when they take these wells off the orphan well fund. And then they've, they, they've released all their liability and kept their assets. So it, it's actually, who's the fool in it? So I, I don't, I, I don't maybe think it's the new company actually. I want to turn to my last question because I am cautious of time here, uh, Reeve. And I want to know, this is not an issue that is going to be fixed overnight. And your county and counties across Alberta are facing this issue on a day-to-day -day basis. What do you do in the short term? What does the county like you and your council and you as Reeve do to rectify the situ situation in the short term? Is it just 
hope people pay and just assume people are going to pay. And if they don't, well, that's what it is or what? No, no, ab- absolutely not. We, we did a tax increase on all levels last year. And uh, that was a very hard decision, but a lot of that was based on, on what we have as revenue and, and a big portion of that is what we're not paid as that revenue. So, so that tax increase, uh, because we, over the last two to three years, we've talked to our residents and basically every, you know, it either becomes a user pay system because you either, if you, if you don't collect it, you have to charge a user fee or, or, or an end user fee for that service. So we, we brought that in because people still wanted their roads graded the same frequencies. They still wanted the snow plow. So, you know, that, that's the tough question. Then all of a sudden looking at this increase in capital and equipment, you go from a point of maybe writing a check for equipment to having to, to having to borrow money on equipment. But you have you in, in order to maintain where you're at, it changes the whole philosophy of how how maybe a county's budgeted in the past. I, I spoke to you, one of your colleagues, council, uh, the Reeve for Woodlands County, uh, John Burroughs, and he said, and this kind of shocked me, that in his budget, he has a $3 million line item that says, we're not collecting $3 million of property taxes from these companies, and we just have to budget for that. We just we're, We have to collect, and we can't run a deficit, so we have to budget for a minus $3 million property tax revenue. Is that what's happening in your county as well, or are you sort of hoping that people actually do pay their taxes <laughs> um we we dealt uh actually, actually with trident we, we we were a partner um with that with woodland on the trident uh, we took them to court over it we actually two counties lost but the judge it was based on how a document uh, how all the documentation was written up uh as far as the policies and procedures that we we lost but the judge couldn't even figure out how we lost so, so it, it is very good data for the RMA to have as they're taking this fight forward. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, they have a bigger tax loss than what we do. But yes, we certainly, we have that number summarized continually. You have to show it as assumed revenue, but you do know where you're at. You're not counting on paying that because you haven't collected it yet. We don't we don't get paid our taxes until October. My last question for you, Reeve, is this. We have a provincial election on the horizon here. We have two parties who are in the legislature. What are you hoping to hear from the two major parties when it comes to this issue and addressing it for counties like yours? I uh, there, there was such a bit of a shakeup at the AAR. I do believe both governments have to come forward and tell us there's going to be a bigger shakeup uh, because at one point we heard that they were not tax collectors. You know, when you lobby, tried to lobby the AER on this, which they're, they're, you know, there should be our partner on this. So um, it, it does come to the fact that they have to hold these individuals accountable. There's a lot of things that has to happen within our province from whichever party gets in, but we will be up at RMA next week. Our convention is next week in Edmonton and believe me, um, any, member that we get a hold of uh, is going to get their ear chewed off as far as it comes to unpaid taxes. What would you want people to know about this issue that we haven't talked about? Because I can imagine there's something in the back of your head that is saying, I need to, I need to talk about this. What is that issue for you? Um, that issue is, is we have, a we have a lot of companies and a lot of, I would foreign investment within our province that feels they don't have to pay their fair share to take that energy out of our, our our province and that i guess revenue out of our province they don't have to they don't they don't have to pay what it should cost them to do it they use our roads they use all our facilities um and they use everything within the alberta they're 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 really not just the municipality they're after it's it falls back onto our whole taxation public so i guess to say to people we we want we want to grow within that with our municipality but as far as these people um, we don't want people like that in our communities because they're not community minded. They're not part of your community. They're just basically, I would say a leech that's sucking revenue out of our communities. So, uh, that's what I'd like to say. And I, hopefully we never run into another Trident again, because that's, uh, that was, that was very devastating to a lot of our municipalities. Despite recent amendments to provincial legislation, the issue of unpaid oil and gas property taxes remains unresolved in Alberta. The Alberta government has provided, though, municipalities with tools to use for unpaid taxes, giving them secured creditor status in bankruptcy proceedings. The Alberta regulator was also given the option to consider property taxes 
and surface lease payment records when assessing risk levels. However, these changes may not have been effective in resolving the issue as you heard today from our guest. As a solution, RMA suggests that the AER should prohibit any company in arrears on property tax or service leases from operating. By doing so, the regulator could prevent companies from continuing to extract and sell oil and gas resources when neglecting their financial obligations to municipalities. Rural Municipalities of Alberta President Paul McLaughlin stated in the March 7th news release, the lack of regulatory framework and accountability has allowed poorly regulated companies to continue operating, leading to a burden on rural municipalities. McLaughlin also accuses the AER of supporting zombie companies by failing to address the impacts of poorly regulated companies that eventually fail, leaving municipalities to bear the costs. The RMA president's statement highlights the ongoing struggle between municipalities and some bad apples in the energy industry in Alberta, particularly in rural Alberta. Hours after the RMA released their press release, Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs Rebecca Schultz released a statement indicating that the Alberta Energy Regulator will have an essential role in resolving the ongoing issue of property tax and surface lease payments. The minister's statement may be seen as a positive development for rural municipalities in Alberta who have long called for solutions to this issue. Now, at the time of publication, Thursday, March 16th at 5 p.m., the AER did not respond to our two interview requests on the topic of the oil and gas industry failure to pay property taxes and the request by RMA to prohibit any company in arrears on property taxes or surface leases from operating. While this is an ongoing situation and rural municipalities will need to address these issues raised in today's show, with the upcoming provincial election, all political parties will need to address this issue to ensure rural municipalities aren't left holding the burden of some bad apples. This has been a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Thank you for tuning in, and remember, just keep talking.